Welcome to Just Us, the podcast where we explore the magic of nerdy living. I'm D&D Wife, your artistic guide to all things geeky and wonderful. And I'm DM Eguile, your seasoned storyteller and passionate gamer. Together we're here to share our adventures and insights into living a fulfilling nerdy life. Each week we dive into topics like navigating relationships in a nerdy world, maximizing your RPG experiences in small spaces, and growing your own herbs and veggies on a tiny patio. We'll also share our favorite hobbies, budget-friendly tips for having epic fun, and stories from our homebrew world of Extraeus. Whether you're a fellow nerd, a tabletop enthusiast, or just looking for inspiration to pursue your passions, we've got something for you. So grab your dice, your favorite snacks, and join us for a journey into the heart of nerdy living. Tune in to Just Us, where love, creativity, and adventure are always on the agenda. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Couple of Nerds. I'm your host, D&D Wife, and for this very special Comic Cave segment, I'm going to have my special guest host, Eric, joining me today. Hello, hello. It's good to be back. It's <laughs> always a pleasure. Absolutely. We're so glad to have you back. And because this is a special Comic Cave, we're going to be talking specifically about your journey into miniature painting and uh, you know how you got into it, your journey up until now, and all the different challenges you faced up until... Uh, you know, up until this moment. <laughs> well, being um, a slightly inexperienced painter and relatively new to this, I can tell you it's quite the journey mm -hmm. just starting out. Yep, yep. Uh, you know, we're going to be revealing and discussing some of the best miniatures that you've painted. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're definitely going to be focusing on all the different details, everything that you did to uh, to sort of bring them into reality. We're going to delve into your inspiration, stylistic choices, and the unique challenges that come up with painting these miniatures, including painting Warhammer miniatures, which are super difficult to paint. Oh, they, they can be. And <laughs> yeah, absolutely, they can. Mm -hmm. um, so tell us a little bit first, uh, just kind of describe the array of miniatures that you've brought for us today. Well, for the miniatures that I brought for you guys today, uh, definitely represent some of my best paint jobs. Mm -hmm. um, they are all Warhammer miniatures, uh, just because they are um, they're easier to paint in some regards for scaling, but oh. they have their own complications for the sheer amount of detail. Yeah. Um, I have painted other miniatures, uh, D and D wise, and other random mm -hmm. odds and bits, um, but. Considering the scaling, they they can be very challenging. Absolutely, I, I am not confident with eyes. I I so bad at eyes. They're they are tough, and they are the bane of every miniature painter's existence. <laughs> oh, so um, true. Uh, but yeah, go through each and every one, and just kind of give us a small description of what they all each look like. Okay. Well, um, if we wanted to just start from what's close, mm -hmm. um, I have here um, the first one. It's a Necron Overlord or Pharon in this oh. case. Um, it would be taller than a human per se, but he's a, a robot okay. for all those who are uneducated when it comes to <laughs> Warhammer, which is totally fine. It's very vast and it takes mm -hmm. a lot of time, but a lot to put of it, lore. yeah, a lot of lore, <laughs> I mean, unimaginable amounts, mm -hmm. but he's basically, uh, think, uh, an Egyptian Terminator would be oh. the easiest way to describe this. He has a, um, a scythe, um, okay. staff that, uh, indicates his power. He has a billowing cape, uh, mm. that is, um, embroidered with uh gemstones yeah. he has this uh shield on his back well m more of a carapace per se but uh it almost looks like a shield but yeah he's um he would be one of the individuals that's in charge of yeah, everything right. so he's like a blinged out terminator yeah but someone who's like in charge gotcha. like he, he he gives orders um mm -hmm. the next uh smallest one still in the same size range mm -hmm. uh this is a plasmancer, Ooh. although this one is uh, lovingly converted. I uh, had a lot of fun mm -hmm. with this miniature. Because um, normally, they're floating around on a little stem, because they're supposed to be hovering. Oh. But some miniatures, are trying to do flight stands is hard. So I, it's for the, tough. Yeah, yeah, for the alteration on this one, I have him walking. Mm -hmm. uh, and Maybe he's, he just landed for a bit. Yeah. Oh, yeah, just a little <laughs> bit. Um, other than that, he's got a, he's got a slightly different head, mm. and to give a more macabre approach on this one for stylistic reasons, but also some of the lore for yeah. the Necrons, uh, he has body parts hanging off him Ooh. as well as a large flensing claw. Gotcha. Yeah. He's, and along with that, you have some of these other ones. Mm -hmm. uh, you have a canoptic spider here, um, gone by different names. It's, a. Uh, Currently, yeah, it's currently a canoptic spider, but it's also been known as a tomb spider. Oh. Uh, it's... They look they're, crazy. Yeah, they're... 
in the lore they're workers they help maintain the two the tomb worlds but they also spawn smaller scarabs that are in charge of repairing things but it was a it was a pain and i spent way too much time (laughs) painting that miniature for all the extra effects because it has an interior and you can't really see the interior but i spent hours painting that interior because i'm a completionist hey man it shows in the details hours of my life i will (laughs) never get back but it's all good and then we have a couple different uh, destroyer models mm-hmm. here, um, or Necrons, of course. <laughs> um, some of them have been going through different phases of the cults. Uh, mm-hmm. This one here is a Hexmark destroyer. Ooh. It has multiple guns, and it's all about sneaking up from behind and uh, bringing justice to those people that don't realize he's there. Gotcha. This Ooh. is an Ophidian destroyer. Oh. They are the sneaky, slinky, uh, spooky uh, destroyers they tunnel underground and they pop up and they grab you down below and they yeah they do whatever they want to you at that oh, point gosh uh, I see. yeah we got an old um this is a vehicle from the beginning of the lore it's mm-hmm. known as an annihilation barge Ooh. haven't done too much to it other than some of the uh glowing um energy effects mm-hmm. on it in the base which was really fun to make it look like it's floating because it's supposed to be yeah. but i despise clear stands with a passion mm. So it was a real fun, you know, making that yeah, challenge come to life. It looks good. It looks good. And then we have uh, three uh, much larger miniatures mm-hmm. here. Um, the smaller of the three, um, it's known as Illuminor Zazeras. He's, to put it real simply, he's a cryptech. He's oh. like the cryptech. Gotcha. And basically thinks space magic. He's like a big yeah. guy. Oh, yeah, yeah. He's a big guy. He's he, He's been augmenting himself. He wasn't that big to start with. Ooh. And yeah. from there, we've got... A Catan shard, for those Mm -hmm. who don't realize what that is. It's basically, think, um, a god that's been given actual form. Uh, But after, but not to dive too deep into the lore, needless to say, they were torn apart by the Necrons because they screwed over the Necrons and the Necrons got them back. Oh, yeah. So he's, yeah, he's was, he was fun. just tools at this point. Yeah, they're absolutely tools. And then you have the big man himself, the Silent King of... He's a three-piece, well, really, he's more of a uh, like six-piece miniature because yeah. <laughs> of the Meneers, the king mm-hmm. himself, uh, the two members of the Triarch on his Deus of Dominion. That was by itself a 50-hour project, and I, yeah, I, I, I it, never it, want to paint that miniature again. <laughs> <laughs> it definitely shows, and I am right there. There are some miniatures out there that I've painted that I will never touch again if I can help it. Yeah. Um, but just for people who don't know, what are the Meneers, you said? Yeah, they're... Um, the, to put it simply, they're effectively protection drones. Mm. Like think of um, like the the four prop drones that we have nowadays that just fly around and they protect the king Ooh, from so danger. These are like floating shields that shoot lasers at people. Yes, oh. yes, it's basically exactly what gotcha. they do. And uh, tell me a little bit about like why you chose this army, how you chose not just the army but like, the stylistic choices you made in the design of them. All right. Well. To start off with, uh, I did choose them for a couple of reasons. One, mm. I'm, a, I'm a fan of the Terminator series. Yeah. <laughs> and back in the day, uh, during uh, with all the Blanche artwork, which is one of the primary individuals responsible for the way Warhammer looks, mm-hmm. Terminator was the inspiration behind oh, a lot of that, which is why cool. on the bases, yeah. which was always one of my favorite funny gimmicks of Terminator... <laughs> There's skulls everywhere. Of course. <laughs> but there's no rib cages. There's no arms. Just there, there's just skulls. So just that's skulls. why on these bases, there is an <laughs> obsessive amount of skulls. <laughs> nothing else. And that's cool, though. It definitely adds a sense of the macabre. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, but on top of that, Necrons being a race that originally was organic, but then to shed their living flesh because they lived short, miserable lives mm. from an irradiated sun that ruined them um, genetically. Yeah. They did the great biotransference and became Necrons, gotcha. which now they are immortal, but soulless and unfeeling. So it is this, I really do like um, very gothic and uh, how can I even say it? I'd like just undead mm-hmm. is the easiest way to put it. Mm-hmm. I'm really into that kind of stuff, even with other games that I play. Gotcha. So... It, it was a natural pick for me. Yeah, I mean, they certainly fit your aesthetic. They've got the dark sort of theme. Oh, yeah. uh, even though they've got the vibrant green on them, it definitely looks sinister. It does not look fun. Yeah, and a, lot, <laughs> a lot of things in Warhammer are grim dark. Mm-hmm. That is definitely part of the theme. 
and I'm happy I was able to achieve that. Yeah, and I can see a lot of detail work went into this. How did you prepare for bringing all of this to life? What was what does your space look like? Okay, well, my painting space, which has changed over time, but uh, it primarily is my desk. I have an mm. office at home, nice. which is for me when I'm doing stuff for normal work, but also when I have free time. Mm. It's, it's basically a desk. I have a really bright light overhead, but I don't have a desk light. And mm. then I have a mat that I throw down okay. with a bin for water and my brushes and then a giant cardboard box of paints. It's very unorganized, which is un <laughs> uncharacteristic of myself. I'm mm. very organized in most parts of my life. But for that, because for the amount of times I have to move stuff, mm -hmm. boxes work. Yeah, I will say miniature painting is a messy mm -hmm. and just it, ta it has a lot of moving parts. So it's really tough to keep track of everything. I, I can see how it can get out of hand sometimes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it, it takes time, effort and space. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You kind of you kind of do need a little bit of space at least for all those paints. <laughs> Um, but, you know, I want to specifically dive in to the stylistic choices and some of the painting challenges that you had mm -hmm. uh, with painting miniatures. They uh, tend to have such unique, distinct styles, even though they all share a central sort of color scheme. Mm -hmm. They are all different in the way that they're uh, molded, what they're showcasing. I mean, the king is on on a whole throne. Uh, so how how did you, I guess, come up with different techniques to tackle each of these differences in texture? A lot of trial and error, mm -hmm. which I know is not always the answer people want to hear when hey. it comes to... That's what it takes sometimes. Oh, it, it, it <laughs> does. But um, basically, to, to break it down simply, it was a matter of finding out what the color scheme was going to be. Mm -hmm. So I took my favorite dynasty within the Necrons, which is Ooh. the Sawtech dynasty, but they have a very Terminator-esque scheme where mm. they are bright chrome silver all over their bodies. Ooh, it's actually okay. a very bland scheme and basic. Oh. So what I did was I took the primary colors from that set, which mm -hmm. are black, silver, and green, and I inverted them oh. on where they were supposed to go. So if you were to look at this oh. army and if you were to just switch out where the black and silver went, you yeah. would have the correct uh, Sautex scheme. So this would all be black, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. All the silver bits would be black and all the, yeah. That is definitely interesting to see. I I kind of really like that you inverted all the colors. I'm visualizing how the metal would look all mm -hmm. over the place. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've said this before, large swaths of metal can really wash out yeah. a miniature and you can lose a lot of the detail in those large swaths. So I really like that you made it so that the metal is detail work instead mm -hmm. of like the main focus. Of course, but that did present a, a different challenge because mm -hmm. for when it comes to painting techniques, at least, usually for like that saw tech scheme, mm -hmm. you would just paint everything black for starting because then you have all of the paint in the deepest recesses, yeah. which makes things easier for highlighting, shading, and all the, the other aspects. Mm -hmm. Instead, I had to do it in the reverse where I had to base coat all of my miniatures oh. in a chrome color. It was, um, oh. oh, I forget the exact paint, but it's from the Citadel range. Mm. Um, lead Belcher, that's what it is. Gotcha. It's one of those, it's that silver. It looks great. It really looks like proper metal Thank you. on yeah. here. Yeah. Oh, there's a lot more than three colors in them, I promise you that. <laughs> oh, I definitely. I see little pops of other colors everywhere. Uh, I see bronze effects on here, mm -hmm. too, which are really difficult to contrast with with a silver metal. Um, so it really looks great. Um, there's also all these little finicky green parts that you had to paint with, like the lightning uh, aspects here, all of the different spheres that are floating everywhere. Uh, how did you get the green in place? place without sort of muddying the rest of the colors again a lot of trial and error but <laughs> usually um smaller brushes because mm -hmm. uh, sometimes you can get away with a good like number three or number four i, yeah. I really do prefer those sizes for basic grunt work mm -hmm. uh, regardless of the size of the miniature especially if i'm trying to be crisp with the details yeah. but for the lightning effects for some of the smaller orbs you're mm -hmm. going down in brush size because you're usually having to build up a gradient um, starting with something as basic as a, if it's going to be a light effect it's like well am i going to start with a green or am i going to start with mm -hmm. a white do i want this to be bright or more saturated yeah. and dark so it it really does depend mm -hmm. on what it is but it's it's always about building up at least for yeah. at least 
this style of painting. Right. Start small and build up because if you put too much, it, it can be really difficult to nigh impossible to bring it back down to what you need. Oh, yeah. Stri stripping paint for miniatures because you made mistakes is not fun. Mm. I can attest to that nightmare. Yeah. And painting over it just adds more texture that you might not want on the miniature. Yeah. Absolutely. And one of the things I'd love to point out on here is all the orbs are not just straight green. They mm -hmm. all have variants of light, dark, and in between. Uh, they've got these beautiful swirls in them that yeah. make it look like they're moving, like it's moving energy. And it's not just present in the orbs. I see it in some of the spears as well. So it gives it more of like this... Uh, uh, not metallic, but kind of like a jade look where, where it's like see-through crystal almost. It's really uh, beautiful. I really appreciate that because mm -hmm. it was the effect I was going for because nice. for the Necrons, it is living metal. Oh. The, the, the metal that they are encased with is encased in, apologies, is not just metal it repairs itself it acts oh. it acts a lot more organically than one would think. It's more like a symbiote. Yes. Oh. It, so to have that more I guess you could say human and or living mm -hmm. effect for the energy and other aspects was key to help bring this to life. Mm -hmm. And and I got to ask, as a colorblind person, how how challenging was it to not just come up with the color scheme, uh, but also apply it in a cohesive look to, to the miniatures? Oh, uh, tutorials are great. <laughs> yes, they tutorials are. Tutorials are great, mm -hmm. um, especially when it came to this color scheme. I, um, I had to pick and choose all over the place because okay. I was changing things. Yeah. And I had to look at, okay, well, if I want to do um, green effects, mm -hmm. which are very common for these types of miniatures, yeah. it's like, okay, hey, what's the most common colors to start with or hey which ones work great for this and mm -hmm. i found that some of those tutorials were great and some of them weren't so good but yeah. <laughs> it but all that experimentation did lead to some awesome uh, effects that yeah. i then ended up keeping for future aspects on this project oh can you show us some of those accidental oh of uh, course of course effects? of course so for example on the ophidian destroyer here um i was experimenting with um contrast paints uh which to put it simply, they act more uh, like shades, mm. where you basically, you're highlighting everything in the beginning, and then you're throwing this contrast on top, which okay. then sets the color. And I hadn't used them before, but instead of getting the glowing effect that I was going for, it, it actually uh, melded with the acrylics that I had in the area and gave this, uh, like you said, almost moving energy effect mm -hmm. through the blade, which was, was not what I was going for, but I loved it so much. I was like, okay, putting that keeping in the... Keeping it. <laughs> I'm keeping it, and we're using it for other aspects. It's actually how I got the swirl effects, uh, the blending effects in the Meneers, as well oh. as some of the other weapons. Uh, it was actually interesting to see two different paint types, uh, considering acrylics are by far your most common paints mm -hmm. for a lot of things. Oh, yeah. But with the contrast range they're not meant to be used together. Like, they can complement each other in different aspects, but you're usually not mixing them. They and I tend, yeah, they tend to blend. Yeah, so I actually had a lot of unique successes by just mixing paints that were actually never meant to go together. That's amazing, because it looks so good. I love that a happy accident came to such a wonderful like effect thank you it really shows that e even if you're not confident in your painting even if you're a, a beginner you can still get into this and you can still come up with some amazing looking artwork just by giving it a shot oh yeah you, you got to give it a shot because uh mm -hmm. Several hundred miniatures ain't going to paint themselves overnight. <laughs> yeah. And I want to talk about your use of effects paints in this. Uh, beyond just the metallic, obviously, how, well, first, how did you apply the metallic with without getting, like, all the bumps and, and essentially lumpy paint all over the place? Okay. I'll be honest. I kind of cheated <laughs> because for some of these miniatures, for the high level of details, for the curved surfaces and the flat surfaces, because mm. turns out painting flat surface metallics is so hard especially with a brush i used a rattle can that oh. actually because thankfully for the color scheme i was using lead belcher which is a great silver metallic mm -hmm. comes like in a rattle can so i was able to base coat all of these with a nice thin layer you could obviously get the same effect with an airbrush yeah. um i haven't delved into that because it's um it takes time and effort but gotcha. no it's it's the easiest way to get clean metallics and setting yourself up for success for mm -hmm other aspects if you're trying to layer on or even then you can apply techniques later whether it's 
adding texture or even grunginess to show rust or anything mm-hmm. else. So it, but yeah. you, you need that f- those first couple layers to be good, thin, and smooth. Yep, absolutely. Because otherwise, lumpy paint, nobody yes. wants. And, well, regardless of that, though, if you are going to use with a brush, pro tip, thin your paints. I know <laughs> yep. everyone's going to mm-hmm. say it, but sometimes you're going to have to do five, six, seven layers of ultra thin paint on something, yep, yep. and you can get the same effect. It just takes way more time. Mm-hmm. We also have these lovely sort of effects on the crystals where it's a darker color leading to lighter color, le- giving it that glow effect, as well as some of the glow uh, effect around the base area as well, which is lovely. And uh, the skulls I really loved as well. They've got that sort of aged effect is really good. And that's actually all a combination of different techniques, mm. of whether it's um, acrylic paints, contrast paints, or even technical paints. Because mm, cool. um, so like, all the dirt in the ground there, um, some of them are set, they're part of the bases that the mm-hmm. miniatures came on, but with a lot of the other ones, I was actually getting um, texture putty with a sculpting tool, and I was going through, and yeah. I was making the dirt myself and Oof. getting everything to look the right way. Uh, I think the base uh, material in it was pumice. Cool. It actually helped make it just look realistic, and from there, I was painting everything up. The the crystals... Uh, their base with uh, acrylic paints and then i was using um, some contrasts but specifically i was dry brushing which is i love that technique yeah, you, get, you can get super some fun. really it adds awesome a lot of detail uh, and then on top of that then there's a technical paint there's a glow paint on most mm-hmm. of the crystals that's been either brushed or dry brushed on nice. yeah in case we put it under black light that'll look super cool i yeah. love those detail effects yeah. um but you know i do want to cover the fact that this you, these are warhammer paints and differing from D D, which which can have its own challenges uh this is a whole different beast because you had to paint an entire army mm-hmm. and uh forgive me if i'm wrong but you had said your army is worth like nine thousand points yes. at this point yes it is in the current edition it's basically nine thousand points and is that is... the full army yes that is the full army how many miniatures is that it's 217 and you painted all of them yes in a year it was a nightmare. Oh, my. And and if I remember correctly, again, it took you the year prior to that to put them all together. Yes. It was an entire year of purchasing miniatures because Warhammer is unfortunately not the cheapest hobby. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then once I had collected and built them all, I then went through the painstaking task of painting. And when you have that many minis with so many projects, mm-hmm. it was basically every night doing two or three hours for 365 days wow and i've got to say you've done an amazing job here the amount of detail is incredible for you having to pay 200 miniatures yeah well it's you figure out what works what what doesn't Mm. um for example i didn't bring one but one of the basic troops for this army is known as a necron warrior it's basically Uh. a shambling uh robot skeleton zombie thing gotcha But to put it simply, once you've figured out how to efficiently paint one, Mm -hmm. it doesn't take that long. Uh, You just have to figure out where you can make your mistakes and where you can speed up processes. It's like, oh, hey, if I put these paints on first, it's not going to affect this. And when I clean up this area later, oh, great, that that gets taken care of instead of doing steps over and over again because Mm -hmm. you don't have the steps down. Right. So it's just it's easier to take your time Mm -hmm. and be patient. I know that's not what everybody wants to hear sometimes, but it really patience is the game when it comes to painting this amount. Oh, yeah. When you want (laughs) consistency over an army Mm -hmm. uh, or even a small task force, if that's what you're going for, of course, You, you it takes time and diligence and just paying attention to the details because you think you have it right mm-hmm. and you set it on the shelf and then you spin it and you see something that you missed and it's so oh. glaring it's painful you're like no <laughs> grab the miniature it's like okay another mm-hmm. another hour of painting because oh, it's it's the worst it yeah. is absolutely the worst and can you detail like maybe some uh different uh challenges or techniques that you use in warhammer versus D D? say oh well that's that's really simple so when it comes to Warhammer and D&D, mm-hmm. so Warhammer, for the most part, it, Warhammer can be easier than D&D mm. for two primary reasons. The miniatures are larger yeah. because they're in a 28 uh, millimeter heroic scale or mm. 32, really. It's the, it's bigger. Yeah, it's bigger. Yeah. <laughs> versus D&D is usually 25 to true 28. Mm. So larger miniatures, larger detail. And with 
uh, this plastic being of really high mm-hmm. quality, you, it, it holds the paint really well, especially nice. if you've done your part with priming and everything yeah. else. So that part kind of takes care of itself. Mm-hmm. You know, you still have to put in the time and make sure you follow your, your lines because are you painting in the lines? Are you painting outside of the lines? Yeah. Are you trying to blend or shade or are you using overbrush techniques? It really mm-hmm. depends. Uh, but for a lot of a lot of Warhammer stuff, people tend to paint them only with three colors because yeah. that's the standard for playing the game. Gotcha. You have your miniature has to be put together, mm-hmm. and then it needs to have just three colors, and you can to take it to a store. What it looks like. Yeah, and then you can take it to a store and you can play oh. it if you're trying to at least follow the basic rules for it. And how did you make those choices about which miniatures to paint first? Because you were were you playing while you uh, were painting them? I was. I was. Uh, it was basically, hey, what what's the most important thing mm-hmm. for the army? Like, it's like, am I going to make a bunch of troops or am I going to what do I have, need? yeah, like, do I want vehicles? It it really all depends. Gotcha. But, but even like, it's the same for Dungeons and Dragons or if it's a pet project. Like, mm-hmm. I, I've I have miniatures that I've grabbed that it's like, oh, this looks great. I want I want to paint this, but it's <laughs> not like something I was going to use in a game. Although that has happened with me being a dungeon master at times, I've used random miniatures right. to. But you save those for something. last. Oh yeah, well, I mean sometimes you love it so much you, you squeeze it in there where you can. Yeah, you make the time. Exactly, <laughs> but even when it comes to painting certain things for D and D, like you could paint scales on a dragon or even yeah. like a lizard folk, and I found it's not too bad as long as you're not choosing colors that conflict with each other like if you're trying to do a blue so yeah maybe you want it to be really bright Mm -hmm. so you start off uh, uh, painting the entire miniature white then you're throwing down your blues and you're getting the the gradient Mm -hmm. as close as you can and then you're throwing a wash on it and then you're looking for definition and you're changing your light sources to see hey where is it hitting Mm -hmm. and you're trying to create all of the natural shadows and shading that you would like it just for I guess for D and D, especially if you're wanting it to have that realistic appearance, you're just spending more time because mm. of the scale. Of course, if you're painting a large monster, that yeah. that's easier. Well, at least relatively speaking, and for you that. can focus more on it versus painting an entire army. Oh, of course, of course. <laughs> but even um, but these same techniques can be applied to terrain mm. because regardless if you're trying to do, um, like just a big ruined castle yeah. or a lake or anything mm-hmm. else there's a lot of ways to do that whether it's with resin pours or um, adding paint to certain areas that you wouldn't expect cool that is just so amazing and i, I cannot believe that you managed to paint 200 and plus miniatures it, even in a year that is that is ridiculous i never want to do it again that is almost that is almost one per day Oh, I, I know. That's... I remember. I, <laughs> wow. I was I was pulling hair and teeth out. <laughs> uh, but thank you so much for showing us these wonderful miniatures. If you guys are interested in seeing pictures of Eric's amazing work, let it, uh, go ahead and join us on the Couple of Nerds Discord. We're going to be showcasing the photos of his miniatures up close. Uh, and you can share your own creations on there as well. Let us know what your Necrons look like. And we can have ourselves a, look, a little Necron battle in the comments. <laughs> and then, so just uh, kind of recap. Capping today's episode, we did a little bit of a deep dive into the art of miniature painting from Eric's perspective as not just a miniature painter, but a Warhammer painter. Uh, you gave us a few techniques uh, and that you used to bring these figures to life to make them look not just like robots, but like actual proper sinister evil robots. Uh, you know, because you can paint a robot, but to add that sort of emotion to it is really important. Uh, and you also kind of showcase some of the challenges that you ran into with painting uh, not just detailed miniatures, but such a large scale of miniatures. Uh, so that was super fun. Thank you so much for sharing this wonderful uh, pieces with us. Hey, no problem at all. It was an absolute pleasure to be on because mm-hmm. uh, it's always fun to share something that's a, a passion project. It, yeah. You don't always find that where people appreciate it as much as you do. Right, right. You're always worried that people won't see it or if they do that they, they might not be interested or might you know might not be as interested in it as you are. And yeah. so that's always sometimes a worry yeah. and i do appreciate the praise but i'll have to say mm-hmm. i am jealous of your painting as well because <laughs> you, you've painted a lot and you do a great job oh 
Well, thank you so much. We're we both, I think, have our have our own unique strengths, and we bring different things to the table. Especially because I am definitely not as skilled in painting Warhammer miniatures as you are. So it's definitely somewhere where you've got a leg up. Uh, but thank you so much for joining me on today's episode. I truly appreciated having you on there. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. Like, subscribe, review. Let us know what you think. Join us on the Couple of Nerds Discord. Everything you do helps us grow, helps us learn, and helps us bring more content to you for later. Stay tuned for future episodes, and thank you so much. Have yourselves a good night. Thank you. See you. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Just Us. We hope you enjoyed diving into our nerdy world and picked up some tips for your own adventures. We'd love to hear about your own nerdy hobbies and see your unique living spaces. Connect with us on a couple of nerds Discord. Share your stories, photos, and join the conversation with fellow nerds. And don't forget to check out our Couple of Nerds YouTube channel. We post videos showcasing the hobbies, crafts, and small living space innovations we cover in each episode. Whether it's painting miniatures, growing a garden on your balcony, or setting up the perfect RPG space in your apartment, we've got plenty of inspiration and tips to share. Subscribe, like, and comment on our videos, and stay connected with us through all our adventures. Until next time, keep embracing your inner nerd and living your best geeky life. Thanks for listening to Just Us, where we come together in nerdy harmony.